Well, good morning. Rod, I'm speechless. I hope and pray that you realize the blessing you have here at Elmhurst. My goodness. Pastor Greg, worship team, how fast can we get you to Louisiana? <laughs> Woo! My guys would go crazy. My church would go crazy. We have a wonderful worship team. But my goodness, that is a worship experience. I used to always tell Ron, as a matter of fact, I told Pastor Greg on the phone, can you hear, is it doing okay? Is it a little bit of a ring? I'm just trying to make sure that everyone can hear well. Good, good. Uh, when he told me that he led worship, I said, I hate you already. <laughs> I seem to have had 40 plus years of ministry of serving with pastors and following pastors that were so blessed in the area of music and, and worship leadership. In my years as a pastor, when I would ask someone to come and fill my pulpit, it would always be two thoughts. Do I get someone that is really, really good, someone that I really know can, can preach the word, stir lives, and after he leaves, my people would say, why are we putting up with you? Or intentionally get someone that was so awful that when they left, my folks would say, thank the Lord we've got you. So, Pastor Greg, I'm not sure which motivated you. I guess only time would tell. But indeed, thank you so much, Pastor Greg. And oh, my goodness, what a weekend we've had. So, you know, Amy and Jerry and Karen and Gary and John and so many others, Matt, you know, you all have just been awesome. We feel like royalty. As a matter of fact, this morning, Rhonda woke up and she said, if I lived here, I would join this church immediately. And uh, I do hope this is not the last time we're together because you have made an indelible impression upon, upon my life. And thank you so much to the team that came down just before COVID hit and uh, spent some time with our men. We all fell in love with one another immediately. And, and I really did not fully realize how many of the men that were at my prison, they had been actually transferred from Angola, which is Louisiana State Penitentiary, a facility of about 6,000 inmates. We have about 2,100 inmates in our facility, but we're only about an hour and a half apart. And uh, so many of our guys knew Elmhurst and met them at Angola and then through some things that I think God orchestrated, it worked out to where they, you know, Angola was closing down. They were able to come to hunt and we fell in love immediately and everything is, is opening back up for us. Your team will be there in August and you bring as many people as you want. We would love to have you in Baton Rouge. And I'd love to have you come and, and meet my guys who are there in the Lane Hunt Correctional Center. And you're probably saying, I'm not sure I want to walk into a maximum security prison with 2,100 adult men and meet them. I didn't think I did either, to be very candid with you. And in the message and in the time I've got, and I, I don't want to keep you long, I know there are wonderful people that are working with the children and those in the nursery, and I want to be cognizant of time, and I, I, I kind of vacillate, do I talk strictly about prison ministry, do I share a message, uh, do I do a little bit of both, but I think I want to share just as we go through this, a little bit, a little bit about what brought me into prison ministry because I think it will, will have an impact upon your life to understand. We have to have a new view of what is happening in the prisons across the United States and a new view of, of criminal justice. Uh, because to be candid with you, in the 40 plus years that I served as a pastor, the last thing on my mind was prison ministry. As a matter of fact, I had only been inside a prison one time in over 40 years. And as I look back, I wonder how in the world I pastored a church of 5,400 members with a multi-million dollar budget, and we had no prison ministry. We had seamen's ministry, we had ministry to the African American community, the deaf community, and we had ministry to the Hispanic community, but we were doing nothing in prison ministry. 
And through a series of events, I planted a couple of churches and had been blessed through the years that all of the churches that I pastored were growing. But suddenly one day I discovered my church was not growing. It just seemed like in Baton Rouge, due to the oil industry there, that more and more families were being moved to Houston. More and more families were going to Oklahoma, to Georgia. And at the time also, I I have a, a son. We have three children. Rob is my oldest, then we have Eric, and then our our daughter, Emily. And at the time, Eric, who had been a senior, uh, not a senior, he'd been a baseball player at the university there, a highly touted pitcher, big six-foot-four right-handed pitcher. And uh, when he was 18 years old, freshman, he had gone there. uh, He called us on December the 5th, said, Mom and Dad have made the team, I'm pitching. And he said, life is great. I'm having devotion every day with my girlfriend. Uh, Long story short, I had a letter waiting for him from the Philadelphia Phillies wanting to draft him. But the very next phone call was to inform us our son had been hit by a drunk driver and, and was rendered a quadriplegic. And so at that time, we were 15 years of of, of caring for Eric, but you would just have to meet him. He's the most incredible young man imaginable, holds a master's degree in public administration, and uh, believe it or not, with a master's degree, he owns 135 acres of crawfish ponds, which is a big deal in South Louisiana, but does a lot of speaking. And I was at a point in my life where I was just really burned out. I spent 18 months wondering what in the world am I going to do, and maybe it's just time for me to retire. I was approached by a couple of wardens, Warden Burl Kane from Angola, and uh, Warden Seth Smith, who was at the time the, uh, the warden there at Hunt Correctional. And they came to me and said, will you come and take over faith-based programming for Hunt Correctional and coordinate with Angola at the, the Bible College that is there for the inmates? The first thing I had to say to them was, you're crazy. I have never had a prison ministry. I've only been inside a prison one time. And uh, in the words of Warden Seth Smith, he said, that's actually what we want. We want someone with a pastoral background. So I asked them to give me a little bit of time to think about it, talk about it. They wanted to tour me through the prison. And as I walked through that last set of steel gates and when they clanged behind me, I had an experience that I will never forget. It was as if the Holy Spirit whispered right over my shoulder, you're home. I was startled. I literally turned and looked over my shoulder. Home, I'm inside a maximum security prison. But I took the next two or three weeks to really take a look at a passage of scripture that bothered me. I hope it bothers you a little bit as we go through this message today. This is not the key scripture. I'm kind of adding this at at no extra charge. But in Matthew 25, we find the words of Jesus, I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in, naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? The king will answer and say, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of the, these brothers, the least of mine, you did it to me. And I said, Father, I have had closed closets, food pantries. We've done food drives. We have hospital ministry. Every staff member has an appointed day of the week to go to the hospital. But I said, there's one thing I have never done. I have never made a concerted effort to go into a prison. And if you would just give me a little time, I'm committing to you, I'll do it. What I discovered inside those prison bars being a person who had grown up with this, and listen to this and see if you've ever heard it before, lock them up and throw away the key. Have you ever heard that one? If you did the crime, do the time. Ladies and gentlemen, we are wrong. It didn't work. Over 85% of the incarcerated people in this country will end up back on the street, which means I can have an inmate in my cell blocks that when he reaches his sentence time, when he is fulfilled, 
all of his time, even if he is in a maximum security cell block, we by law have to release him. And two hours later, he can be standing inside a store at a checkout line next to your child. So if we don't do something while they are there, what we are doing, in the words of, 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 of Warden Cain, if we do not change a man's character, if we merely want to educate inmates, all we're doing is creating a smarter criminal. And here's what really clinched it for me. I looked at him and I realized when Jesus said, I was in prison, you visited me. These are men Jesus loves. These are men that Jesus died for. These are men and women that matter to God. And if they matter to God, they matter to me. In 2014, I answered that call eight years ago. And let me tell you, you may think I'm crazy. I'm having the time of my life. I have fallen in love with a bunch of criminals <laughs> and crooks. And I get to see God do things that you cannot even begin to fathom. Because of those men, what I discovered was that over 70% of those men grew up in a fatherless home. Over 85% of the men that I work with, over 85% in all probability, over 95% of them have had some type of traumatic event in their life that has caused them to think the way they think and act the way they act. And the shocker that really hit me was the fact that we have in United States prisons at this time over 225,000 honorably discharged veterans. I had over 60 just in my prison alone. And as we launched only the third PTSD program launched in prisons in the United States, as we got into our trauma healing, that's the first thing we do before we put them into PTSD, we go through five days of trauma healing. To see the change in them, my warden finally allowed me to bring all of our veterans into one dorm and to create a veterans mentorship program. Now, what does all this mean to you? Is it just a neat story? Well, I hope in about the next 15 to 20 minutes, maybe I can change it into a life-changing event for you the way it was a life-changing event for me. And that does not mean you need to go inside a maximum security prison. But here's where we really start to understand this. What I came to realize was that through my 40 plus years of ministry, I had really been in a very safe place. I had large staffs. I had people that were doing this, doing that. You know, you lead the children's ministry. You lead this ministry. You lead that ministry. Now, yeah, there's stress. The closest I ever came to committing a crime was when I was a youth pastor and I had a teenage boy to tell me, he said, Brother Lord, now I, I, I want to be a pastor someday. And I said, really? You know, just excited. He said, yeah. He said, I want a job like yours where you only work on Sunday and Wednesday. <laughs> pastor Greg, I wanted to choke him to death. <laughs> but I did not. I did not. I just pronounced a curse on him. No, I'm kidding. I didn't do that. <laughs> Let me share it with you this way. James chapter 2, beginning in verse 17, James wrote these words. In the same way, faith by itself is, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe there is one God? Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. For way too long in my Christian journey, it was almost like faith was something that was bottled up somewhere. And then if I really, really trusted Jesus, and if I really tried to live a good, moral, upstanding life, that God would just pour more and more and more faith into me. That this person had a lot of faith, this person had little faith, and there were always those I idolized because of their faith. But faith is not something that is bottled up inside 
Faith is a life commitment. It is a mindset that causes you to say what you say and do what you do. Faith has to find itself realized in life actions. And Jesus so wonderfully illustrates that for us in Luke chapter 5 by a story he tells, a story that's come to mean a a lot in my life. And I want to share with you the story, and then we'll kind of move quickly to illustrate why this story is so important to you and to me and to the cause of Christ in this crazy world that we're living in. Beginning in verse 7, one day he was teaching. And there were some Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting there who had come from every village of Galilee and Judea and from Jerusalem in the power of the Lord. Now, this is important. The power of the Lord was present for him to perform healing. At this time, we're not, you know, healing is not taking place, but James wants us to understand the power to heal was there to heal both physically and to heal spiritually. Picking up in verse 18. And some men were carrying on a bed a man who was paralyzed, and they were trying to bring him in and to set him down in front of him. But not finding any way to bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and led him down through the tiles with his stretcher into the middle of the crowd in front of Jesus. In other words, they they put him right at Jesus' feet. Now, verse 20, seeing their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven you. The scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this man who speaks blasphemes, who can forgive sins but God alone? In other words, only God can forgive sins. But Jesus, aware of their reasonings, answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts, which is easier to say? Your sins have been forgiven you, or to say, get up and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, get up and pick up your stretcher and go home. Immediately he got up before them and picked up what he had been lying on and went home glorifying God. They were all struck with astonishment and began glorifying God, and they were filled with fear, saying, We have seen remarkable things today. There is a certain element of a myth in in America, and I think the COVID crisis over the last two and a half years has added to it. And that is the idea of always being safe. I'm not saying safe is, is not good. You need to be safe. You're you're looking at the most accident-prone person in the world. Correct, Rhonda? If there's any way I could hit my head on something, I will find a way to do it. It's just ridiculous how many times that has happened. So every time I'm doing something, my wife and my children say to me, be careful, watch your head, watch your head. Matter of fact, with Eric's handicapped truck, it has a door that lifts up kind of like a spaceship and I've hit my head probably, you know, 100, 150 times on it. And he always says, Dad, watch your head. Dad, watch your head. So, you know, we, we wear helmets when we ride our bicycles. I never did that when I was a kid in rural Alabama where I, where I grew up. We, we didn't, you were sissy if you wore a helmet, okay? And now, you know, we, we wash our hands and, and the, it's kind of spilled over even into our churches, Now, I've been a pastor long ago. I love this facility. This this facility is laid out. I actually did my doctoral project on how churches design and implement building programs. This building is laid out beautifully. Man, it's awesome. You've got thinner chairs to, to sit in. The lighting's perfect. The sound's perfect. The temperature's perfect. But so many times through the years, I have heard it. Pastor, sure was hot in there today. Pastor, the service went too long. Pastor's too short. Pastor, I don't like the color of the carpet. Wish the chairs were softer. Wish we had a little more room. We are all about comfort. But is there a possibility that on the spiritual side of things and probably on the physical side of things, as followers of Christ, we're playing it way too safe? Now, breaking the story down, As we go into it, understand this. 
When your faith, a faith that is something you do, is placed completely in the life of Jesus. I love the lyrics of the songs about Jesus in our veins. Your life will never be the same. We've said that a thousand times as pastors. You come to Jesus, your life will never be the same. I'm learning to add a little bit to it. Not only will it never be the same, it will never be safe again. And here's what I'm talking about. Faith that rips holes in roofs to get our loved ones to Christ is a dangerous way to live, but it is the only way for true believers to follow Christ. Two sets of people we're going to look at. First of all, the Pharisees and the scribes. Religious people were sitting around Jesus playing it safe. Now, it was customary during that time and in that culture that the teacher would be seated and that the students and those listening would be standing. It was a sign of honor. But it's very clear in the story that the Pharisees and the scribes were what? They were sitting. If you're still awake, follow me. They were what? Sitting. Which meant, number one, Jesus, we're on your equal. And number two, we're here to investigate you and challenge your claim to be the Son of God. So in all honesty, it's a, a symbol of disrespect. And remember it said that the power to heal was in the room, yet they have no recognition of the power that is there to change their lives and those around them. The Pharisees actually were called the dividers. In other words, they divide the word in order that they can make sure everyone was following both the written word that they had at that time, which was five books, as well as the oral tradition. But also, they were not allowing anyone else into the house. They had so crowded around Jesus that they were not, were not allowing anyone else to even approach him. A number of years ago, I had the incredible honor and privilege of spending a week preaching through the churches in Ukraine. My heart is devastated over what is happening in the Ukraine. I was amazed at how those people, when they came into their churches, always made sure that those who were coming for the first time, those who they were trying to lead to Christ, always got the best seats. They always helped them get right down near the front in order that they, they were hoping, praying that their friend would come to know Christ. But they were not really allowing, there was such a crowd, they were not allowing anyone into the house. Everything and everyone they're comparing is saying is that everything according to what I believe, how we worship, what we believe. So somehow the religion itself had become the God. And there's no real relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus basically in too many ways in our day and age has become a lucky charm for life. A ticket to the next life, but no real life for the present. I was sharing a few moments ago with someone that five or six years ago, I spent three months doing an in-depth study of the crucifixion. I realized how in the world I had achieved a doctorate's degree. I was aware of the crucifixion. I knew the basic facts, but I had never studied the crucifixion. To study the crucifixion will absolutely rip your heart out about what Jesus went through and what the Romans were actually doing to the Jewish people and specifically to the Christians. So we live in a world where so often the cross is seen as something decorative and not the pain and the sacrifice for which it, it truly represents. So... These people were in the very presence of Jesus. The power to heal was there in every imaginable way, but they never experienced any of it because they're playing it safe. But what about the faithful? What about the four men that bring their paralyzed friend? They were on a mission, and a dangerous mission at that. 
They wanted to find a way to get through the crowd and get their paralyzed friend in front of Jesus, which meant those four men had to have a very profound faith and trust that Jesus was exactly who he claimed to be, and the man who's on the stretcher had to in some way be a part of that and say, I know I may not get up and walk, but guys, I'm with you. Take me. Because there's no record that he is objecting in, in any shape, form, or fashion. But here's what is, what is so important. Ladies and gentlemen, when you get involved in reaching out to other people, wanting to help them find what you have found in Jesus Christ, whether it's a believer or a non-believer, often it's going to be a dirty business. When I went into that prison, I had all kinds of people asking me, how do you do it? Don't you, you know, do you feel safe? I feel safer in my prison than I do on the streets. And that, that is a true statement. I had a, I had a pastor that, that wanted to take a look at prison ministry, and I cleared him at the gate, got him into the parking lot. He stepped out of his car, and the moment he stepped out of his car, he began to look around, and, and he said, I am freaked out. I said, about What? He said, man, aren't you freaked out? We're inside a maximum security prison. He said, those are, those are prisoners over there. I said, yeah. God loves them just like he loves me and you. He said, well, I don't know how you do it. He said, I'm freaked out. I said, pastor, in all probability, you need to go home. This is not the place for you. But even with Christians, through the years as a pastor in counseling, and being beside loved ones. To stand there counseling with a young man that has a gun in his hand. And you're pouring everything you can into him to say, look, I know you, your, your wife has left. She's taken your two children. But you've still got a lot to live for. Your kids are going to need you. And then suddenly you see his finger do this on the gun. That's not a pleasant business. Life is filled, as we've talked about, with trauma. But God calls we as believers to not only deal with what we're dealing with in our lives, but when we experience the healing that was present in that room that day, to share that healing, and sometimes it is a dirty job. You've got to rip a hole in someone's roof. Just like God ripped a hole in my roof through those two wardens, to show me that God loved 2,100 men that were locked up behind bars. They needed someone to love them. It can be an awfully dirty business. 97% of the women that we have surveyed in our women's prison have had some type of abusive or sexual trauma that's been forced on them in their lives. Over 85% of our men, some type of trauma. And I want to tell you, I bet you a dollar, 95 to 100% of you have either gone through a traumatic experience, you're in a traumatic experience, or it's right around the corner. And it affects your life. It took me 20 some odd years our son was paralyzed 23 years ago. It took me about 19 to 20 years going through a trauma healing class to realize that when a phone rings at night, I always panic because that's when we got the call about Eric. Hit by a seven-time DUI offender. To this day, when I look at my phone and my, my, my wife's name pops up that she's calling me, I do a flashback. Because 18 months ago, I was finishing, it was a beautiful morning, 8.30 in the morning. I had just completed the front porch of our little camp. We have a little place we still have in Alabama, our old family farm. And I'd taken a picture and I was texting my daughter. First sunrise on the porch, first sunrise on the new porch. But I found it odd she was not answering me, so the phone rang and I saw Rhonda. Grabbed it up. I said, Rhonda, you wouldn't. She said, get your bags, come home. They just found Emily. She's not breathing. 
halfway to Baton Rouge, they told me my daughter was home with the Lord. Folks, trauma is real. And in the words of my paralyzed son, God never said, you're exempt. God never promised me it wouldn't happen to me. We've got a job to do. We've got a task to do. And understand this. They faced a crowd that day. Those four men carrying their friend faced a crowd that would not let them through. But they found a way through. They climbed up on the roof. There was actually those types of homes in that day and age. There would be a little stairway that went around the side of the house and up on the roof. They said, let's go to the roof. We'll find a way. Wasn't safe, but they did it. When they got to the roof, they said, how are we going to get down to Jesus? Fellas, there's only one way. We got to claw a hole through this thing. And they went to kicking and scratching, and I dare to say every one of them had dirty fingernails and bloody knuckles by the time they got through that ceiling. But they knew we've got to lower our friend down to the feet of Jesus before he ever rises up. It wasn't safe, but they did it. As they held on to those ropes, wasn't safe, but they did it. The only thing they did safe that day was to totally depend upon and trust Jesus. Matter of fact, there's a wonderful passage out of Romans 8. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son. They gave him up for us all. How will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charges against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us who shall separate us from the love of Christ, shall trouble or hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or the sword. For your sake, we face death all day long. We're considered sheep being led to the slaughter. No, in all things, we are more than what? Conquerors. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels or demons, neither the present nor the future or any powers, neither height, depth, anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Fighters, conquerors. But I so appreciate what Pastor Greg had to say a few moments ago. Because one of the greatest weapons we have is love. I was a young pastor of a small rural church in Alabama. I preached a sermon one Sunday that I knew if Billy Graham could get his hands on it, he would be jealous of it. <laughs> it was the greatest sermon ever heard. We were newlyweds and got in the car and started home and kind of stuck out my chest and waited for the accolades. Rodney sat there and did not say one word. Finally, I said, well, what did you think of the sermon? She said, I didn't like it. I said, what do you mean you didn't like it? She said, because you preached it angry. You didn't preach it out of love. I want to tell you, I was so convicted. My new bride was exactly right. And I have tried with everything that is within me, no matter how difficult the message may be, to bring it in a spirit of love and passion. Those are the weapons God has given us to rip the roof off of someone's life, to allow God to rip the roof off of our life in order that we can have that relationship with Christ that allows that healing power to transform lives. It's depending upon the truth of God's word not a political party, but the truth of God's word, his love, and a passion that he gives us. So in all candor, is following Jesus safe? Yes and no. No, it's not safe because he's going to stretch you. He's going to ask you to do things. There are some of you in here right now that probably have no idea, but you're going to end up down at my prison. And not as an inmate, you're going to come with the, with the mission team. <laughs> And you're going to come down there and you're going to meet some of the most incredible guys you imagine. Well, you're going to say, I had no idea. 
Now, do we have some that need to stay there the rest of their lives? Yes, indeed. I'm not foolish. I'm not foolish. There are some of you that need to go home and talk to a neighbor. Some of you need to sit down and have a talk with your children. You need to rip the roof off and be transparent and tell them the truth about what Jesus Christ has done in your life, what he is doing. Admit some of your shortcomings and tell them that they can be more than conquerors through Christ who strengthens them. It may be serving in the children's area. It may be working with the, the children this week. But I promise you, somewhere there's a roof waiting for you. Let me close with this. My goodness, I'm going to go so over. There's something interesting about the story that I read you. It said that when the day was over, the homeowners stood around and marveled at what they had seen. Now keep that thought in mind. Four years ago, I had a young man by the name of Jacob. I cannot share with you his last name. Jacob came to our prisoner. Good looking kid. You'll know what I'm doing. He was buffed. I mean, he's got arms this big around. He's about this tall. Not an ounce of fat on his body and not a smile on his face. He was tough. And just about every time I saw Jacob, that old expression, he was high as a kite. If there was a drug inside the prison, he'd find it. So he was high on mojo every time I'd see him. He was very, very involved in the Islamic community there. Now, I'm not speaking anything against the Muslims. I'm just saying he was very involved in the Islamic community. And he was a very violent young man. But another one of our guys that God was transforming him developed a relationship with Jacob. And he began to bring Jacob by to see me. And we got Jacob in our veterans dorm as a mentee. We allow non-veterans to come in, but they have to consent to be mentored by a veteran. And I told Jacob one day, I said, Jacob, I want you to come by. Once a week, I want you to come by my office. So he started coming by the office. Finally, one day, all the circumstances were right. And I said, Jacob, if you died right now and stood before the Lord... And he said to you, Jacob, why should I let you into my heaven? What would you say to him? Well, I'm, I'm trying to be good. I'm trying to say, you find that in the Bible. And that would be wonderful, but it's not there. There's only one way to be saved. Only one way to go to heaven. Only one way to have eternal life. Only one way, and that's inviting Jesus Christ into your life. And totally surrendering to him. Jacob looked at me and he said, Doc, that is exactly what I want to do. And that young man, boom, head dropped down. He said, please pray. I want to pray. I want Jesus into my life. We prayed. After he prayed, I said, hey, you want to call your mom? I knew his mom was a, just an old fire believer. Her heart had been broken. We called his mom up and when she got on the phone, all she could do and just, y'all excuse me, I'm from the deep south. All she could do was snot and slobber. Oh, I'm so happy. She couldn't even speak. But Jacob looked at me. He said, Doc, will you baptize me? I said, absolutely. I said, let's do it next week. We set up the baptistry in the chapel. We get a group of the guys that really support you. So the day came to baptize Jacob. Jacob, you know, I, I, they came and got me. He said, Doc, everything's ready. Jacob's got on a robe. And I went in to speak to him before I baptized him. He had a big old black eye and a cut on his cheek. And I wanted to say, what in the world happened to you? That's just my nature. You know, all the guys, if I see so, I'll ask. But it's like the Holy Spirit told me, shut your mouth. Don't say one word. We had a beautiful baptism service. I videotaped it for his mom. And this, when the Baptist baptism was over, the head of my veterans group came to my office and he said, Doc, did you notice... Jacob had a black eye. I said, 
yeah, it's kind of obvious. I said, but I wanted to ask you, but I just felt this incredible spirit in me that said, don't ask him. He said, Doc, thank goodness you didn't. He said, because this morning as he was coming down the walk to be baptized, one of the other Muslims stepped out in front of him and said, Jacob, where are you going? And he said, I'm going to be baptized. When he did, he laid him out. He said, Doc, after he hit him, Jacob gathered himself together, came straight to the chapel, straight into the water. And I wondered, how many believers are willing to live that dangerously? I'm so glad God led Chadley and let me be one of those that helped claw the dirt out to get Jacob in front of Jesus. And now he is absolutely on fire. I cannot wait for you all to meet Jacob. He will, he will set you on fire with his passion for Christ and his humbleness. And I'll leave you with this thought. And when I do, Pastor Greg, I want to turn it over to you. Let him close this service out as, as he sees fit. That night, the homeowners had to have stood there and looked up at the hole in the roof. I said, man, can you believe what we saw today? Jesus is teaching, and this guy comes down with ropes tied on four corners of an old blanket. And this paralyzed guy, we've seen him for years, he, he lands at the feet of Jesus, and Jesus says, your sins are forgiven, rise up. And you know he had to do both. If he can forgive sins, he can heal. If he can heal, he can forgive sins. If he cannot forgive sins, he can't heal. If he can't heal, he can't forgive. You can either do both or you can do none. That's Jesus. They said, did, did you see him? And then he got up and he, he walked out the door. That door he came through. That hole went out. That door. Boy, his friends ripped a hole in the roof. And his life will never be the, be the same. When we're all gone from this earth, is there going to be anyone left behind that said, you know, God really used Doc to rip a hole in my roof. And I got placed at the feet of Jesus and my life's never been the same. What about you? Have you ever lived dangerously enough to stand beside someone grieving, someone going through family problems, someone being abused, someone that's, dealing with substance abuse, someone that is dealing with going to prison, in prison, someone that's dealing with a terminal illness. And you knew this is going to make me really stretch myself. But this person needs healing. I'm taking them to Jesus. I don't care how dangerous it is. Ladies and gentlemen, please, we may be separated by hundreds of miles, but we serve the same God in the same kingdom, but we got the same mission. And that's to rip somebody's roof open so they can find the man with the power to heal. Let me pray with you. Father, thank you. These wonderful people have been patient to allow me to take their time this morning, stretch this service a little longer than I anticipated. But Father, we're here about your business. It's not about playing it safe. It's about releasing the healing power that you have provided because of an empty tomb. We're not Christians because we belong to a church. We're not Christians because of a certain, certain theology that we have. Father, in all honesty, there's only one reason that we're Christians. It's because right outside of Jerusalem, there is an empty tomb. A place called Golgotha, the place of the skull. That, Father, not only your word, but history documents. There was a man that walked out that tomb. Just like the paralyzed man, he walked out the door healed. 
But Jesus walked out as the Savior of the world. Thank you. Father, now may those who need that experience, that healing power, open their hearts and say, Jesus, I come to you. I bring it all to you. Heal me. Forgive me. I know the tomb is empty, but I know that your spirit is filling my life. Father, may we all make the decision that whatever we face when we leave this place, that we will put aside all those safe plans and be willing to live dangerously in the name of Jesus Christ. And Father, we ask it all in your name and for your glory. Amen. Pastor Greg. Thank you, Russ. Shall we thank God?